Section one was really long, so let's, it took me like a half hour to do that one. It's a long video. So let's, well, we'll see if we can make this one a little bit shorter, but luckily it is more positive. Like, look at the background. It screams more fun uh, because it's more about the positive aspect of life rather than the whole part about slavery. There is an extra, uh, there's an essay question in this section as well, so we're getting all three of them out of the way real early, and it's on the different types of colonies. So it's on the charter, the proprietary, and the royal colonies, and then you also have things on this test like the Great Awakening, and the Enlightenment, and Benjamin Franklin, uh, some of the more positive things of this time period, because it wasn't all doom and gloom, there was some actual nice stuff. So they did develop a culture, and it wasn't just a culture based on taking advantage of people, it was a culture where people could learn new things, and they could do new stuff, and they could be a part of improving society and moving things forward. The way that this kind of went down uh, is that you had King Charles II, he was in charge. Uh, people did not like his rule, they didn't like that guy. King James II comes along, uh, he was the next king, and he ended up actually being worse. Uh, his major claim to fame is trying to take power back from Parliament, uh, which Parliament was the English government that gained more power in 1215. You guys may remember a document from 1215 from way back in the day called the Magna Carta, not Magna Carta Holy Grail, that's a Jay-Z album. Uh, so not that, but the regular Magna Carta, that gave the people in Britain power. King James II is now trying to take that power away from the people. He tries to tighten his control over the people and over the colonies, and that is something that people are not okay with. Remember, the colonists left to get freedom. The colonists mostly left England to go over to America to have freedom and do what they want, and now the king is attempting to take that stuff back. And then we get to something called the Glorious Revolution. Uh, they also call it the Bloodless Revolution because the way that this works is very politically in scheming, uh, backdoor deals. Uh, it's actually one of the major reasons why I like history because of the stories that are like this. Parliament, who didn't like King James, they go to King James's daughter, Mary, and they tell Mary, uh, we're going to put you in charge. We're going to kick your dad out, and we're going to let you be queen instead if you sign what we're going to call the English Bill of Rights. And in that, you're going to grant rights to all citizens, and eventually we use this to make our American Bill of Rights. This is our first ten amendments to our Constitution, which we'll go over with Mrs. Fugate as well when she gives you your pocket Constitution. They're those first 10 that we'll look at a little bit more in depth once we get to chapter 7. And what this did was it showed to people that their power is stronger than a monarch. That we can elect people and that elected group of people and the people behind that can be stronger than one. And it showed that you can have a revolution and take power back for the people. And that actually inspires the American Revolution to then go and do the same thing when another king comes along and tries to take power as well. And this is a test question. We got England and how they view America. And they basically view the colonies as an economic resource. They use and they see the colonies as a source of money. And that's all they really see them for. They don't care about their daily lives. They don't care what they're really doing. As long as they're sending money back to the uh, European government back to England, back to the king, then they don't really care what the colonists do as long as they're willing to give them a whole bunch of money. And during that time period when King James was in charge, England made sure they kept making money. They passed the Navigation Acts. And basically it was colonists could not use foreign ships. That means that they had to pay all of the British captains to use their ships to move the products. They could not send products outside of English colonies. So you're not allowed to sell things to anyone that's not an English colony. And that's a big problem because you need more people to sell to. The more people you sell to, the higher you can raise your price. The more products you can sell. 
It would be like opening up a store and saying that only people that are over six feet tall can shop here. You're knocking out a huge population of the country that can't shop at your store unless you're a giant person that's over six feet tall. There's no reason why you would willingly do that. That's only going to guarantee you losing money. But for the British, it guaranteed that they were going to make all of the money that the colonists had instead of the colonists being able to send it to places like Spain or France. And some of the colonists liked the laws, and we're going to talk about loyalists eventually, and luckily for us, once again, they're not very creative. Loyalists were people that stayed loyal to the British government throughout the entire American Revolution. They liked these things because it guaranteed them a place to trade. They were automatically going to have at least someone willing to buy their goods. And then later on, a lot of them start to resent these restrictions, that they think they should be allowed to basically do whatever they want. They got that freedom, and now it's being taken away. They realize that they can make bigger profits by selling to other countries like France and Spain. They can pit them against each other, and they can make them raise their prices. And then some of the colonists didn't like them so much, they just ignored them. And this is going to be a key point when we get to chapter 5, is that they would just smuggle items. So instead of doing things legally, they would just, under cover of like darkness, move products to other places. That way England couldn't keep track of what was going on. They would do it behind England's back, and that ends up causing a lot of tension that eventually in, uh, leads to the American Revolution in chapter 4. And this is the beginning of the essay question. The next two slides go into this a little bit more in depth. So I'll just write this on the top of all three of them. Um, this once again, here you go. Thanks to the Magna Carta, people had gotten more, more freedoms, more power, uh, and that's why a lot of the people in America made republics. And if you remember correctly, it was rep the pubs. They were able to, it should publics. There we go, it makes sense. Uh, rep the pub, representing people. And that's the reason why they made their governments that way. They didn't want one person in charge. And the three types of colonies, there could be republics involved. A charter was definitely a republic. They were definitely repping the pub. A proprietary could be, but was most likely not. Slash, most likely not. And the royal was definitely not a republic. Royal colonies were in, completely in charge of by the king. So a charter colony was where you would be given that grant of rights and privileges. You would be given a piece of land and say, go make money for us. And they could elect their own governors. This is why a charter colony would most likely be a republic that I spelled right this time. A proprietary colony could be. It was where one person was granted the land or an individual or groups of people were granted the land and they could rule as they wanted. So in a proprietary, it could be, if they chose to be a republic, they could. But mostly, it would be one person that they would call a proprietor. That proprietor would make the rules for everyone. And if they wanted to, they could allow the colonists to elect certain members of their government. They could appoint members if they wanted to. They could make laws themselves. But mostly they would appoint people to some positions and then allow other places to elect parts of the government. So charter colonies, definitely a republic. Uh, smaller star down here for proprietary colonies, most likely not, but could have parts of a republic in it. And then royal colonies, definitely not a republic. These would 100% be ruled by the king. And that's a lot of them. Georgia, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. Uh, that's a vast majority of the 13 colonies end up being directly ruled by the king. 
And instead of being uh, in the New World, the king never came to the colonies. The king was always in Britain. And if you listen to Hamilton soundtrack, they talk about how come someone on a tiny island across the sea be in charge of the price of tea. And that's kind of what the major argument was, is the king would appoint a governor. And they would do exactly as the king wanted. If a governor does not do what the king wants, the king basically gets rid of the governor and brings in someone that will uh, do exactly what they want. And even in this time period, we talked about the voting rights before. Uh, before it was old, rich, white men who went to church and owned land. Um, before we got rid of the church part. And now we're basically uh, white men who own land. So this is where we can get rid of church. And now it's basically for an old, rich, white man who owns land, you get to vote. But it's still better than they had it in England. This is still better than they had it in a lot of other places in Europe where it was still just one person in charge. And as I mentioned throughout the year, we'll start getting rid of uh, land. We'll start getting rid of white. We'll start getting rid of eventually rich. We'll start getting rid of man. Uh, and then eventually it's just basically you have to be old, 18, to vote today. And then there's really positive things that were happening in the culture around the colonies during this time period. And one of those things is the Great Awakening. And this is what we'll call the first Great Awakening because we're going to get to eventually throughout the year the second Great Awakening where they have a religious revival. And it's basically where people start going back to religion. They start going back to church. And there's a reason why they do this, and it's because of the fact that they're in this new place, and it's kind of scary, and you can go to a, basically a park, and you can have a pastor or a preacher or a priest give a sermon about how if you lead a good life, uh, good things will happen to you, and a lot of people gravitate to that. And it's also during this time period that we set up basically a, a, a society that we know of today where men are the formal heads of the households. And this is called a patriarch, which is why we get the word pa from. Uh, that's where like pa, pop up, uh, that whole thing comes from that, where it's the men that are in charge. Patriarch is where men are in charge. They're the leaders. They're the people that are going to go to work. They're the people that are going to be the head of the family. And women would stay home and run households. And that's where this whole stereotypical women stay home, men go to work thing starts. That today, that's really starting to be turned around, where women are starting to be much more out in the field of work, which maybe eventually in the next like month from now, uh, we would have a woman president for the first time. So that stereotype is definitely starting to be broke down. And just for your knowledge, uh, when a woman is in charge of society, it's called a matriarch, and that's where you get ma from. So those words actually have a meaning from somewhere else. And one of the things that the people back then did is they placed a high value on education for the first time. But schools were not really set up all that well. Uh, parents would usually be the ones to teach their children to read or write. So that means that your parents had to know how to read or write first in order to teach you. It's New England and Pennsylvania that set up regular schools like we know today. So you can blame New England and Pennsylvania for the reason why you have to come here all the time. And Massachusetts is the one that actually passes that first public education law. That if you have 50 or more homes in a neighborhood, it needs to have a school. So it's, we've gone a long way from having just 50 uh, to our district probably has somewhere close to uh, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, a uh, much larger number than that. And we'll get to the major problems with education later on, but the big one is what they call one-room schoolhouses, where if you think about your neighborhood or kids that ride your bus, you would all be in one room together learning the same thing. So if you have a younger sibling who's like five, if you have an older sibling who's 18, uh, and everyone in between five and 18-year-olds would be in the same room trying to learn the same thing from one teacher. So if you think about it, you might be learning the same thing over and over and over again because they can't really go in depth or do a whole bunch of other stuff. Eventually, New England gets an 85% literacy rate, and that means that they can read or write among men, and then 50% among women, which is huge. Uh, and it's usually women that were running schools, and there's this whole stereotype 
that females and women are teachers and that men are not. And if you think about your elementary schools, usually elementary school teachers are a lot more female. And as you get older, secondary and college professors are a lot more male. Uh, as an elementary major, I was one of the few uh, males in our, a lot of our classes. It would be like two, of, two guys to like 20 girls, uh, which is a huge ratio difference. The fact that that is that stereotype still where women teach younger kids and not men. And then this is uh, just important for one of those Jeopardy facts that the first ever college really in America is Harvard. So whenever someone asks what's the oldest college in America, it is Harvard that is located in Massachusetts. And then we get to Ben Franklin. Uh, we're going to talk about Ben Frank a lot. And Ben Frank, uh, everyone thinks that he's this old guy. That's what everyone always sees him as. Uh, but we're going to talk about him a little bit later on as this strapping young guy who uh, everyone loved, was in love with and how he becomes this huge part of our culture because everyone in France loves Benjamin Franklin and they want to help us to win the American Revolution, and a part of that is because of Benjamin Franklin's popularity with the people over in France. And he becomes popular because of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, you can basically think of it as the Renaissance. It is the Renaissance Part Two. It's where they look to knowledge and reason and science, uh, look to these things and nature uh, in order to figure out how things work. And in that case, Benjamin Franklin is the da Vinci of the Enlightenment. He is the guy that embodies the Enlightenment. He is the one that is the experimenter. That's why they talk about how he's the guy with the key on the flat on the kite. Uh, and electricity is founded by him, and he's able to make a stove, and he makes glasses. Uh, he's that guy that is experimenting and trying to learn new stuff and looking to nature to figure those things out, which is what da Vinci was doing 400 years before him, and now he's that same mold. He has those same skills and those same uh, interests that da Vinci had where he's able to start spreading that knowledge around and gives us a lot of the things that we use today. And it's fun that literally he lived like down the street, like he lived down 95 in Philadelphia and you can go to his house, it's still there. You can go see different things that he invented. So living in our area does have its benefits that we have that historical aspect around us. And one of the major parts of this time period, one of the key things that leads to the war is this idea of freedom of press. And basically freedom of, question, of press is, can you question the people in charge? If someone tells you that the sky is purple, are you just going to say, yeah, the sky is purple? Or are you gonna question them and say, the sky is not purple? And when this first started, that you could question the people in charge, there was a guy that was charged with something called liable. And it's basically where you lie in print, where you write a story that is false. And he's charged with liable. This guy, Peter, John Peter Zenger, is charged with liable because he writes an article that basically questions the royal government. He decided to question the king. And the fact that he did this is huge. No one ever questions the king. You take what the king says and you do it. There is nothing else you can do about it. So when he says, no, you're wrong, they decide they're going to charge him with lying. But what they decided to do, and a guy named Andrew Hamilton argues that free speech is a basic right of the people. That you're allowed to question people if you think they're wrong. And the whole thing is, is, is what you said true or false or is it offensive? And they actually find him not guilty because what he said was true. It wasn't necessarily false. Uh, you could say, if I smelled really bad and you wrote a paper saying, Mr. McCormick smells really bad, uh, and that's true, I cannot sue you for that. It could be offensive, that might hurt my feelings and it might be mean, but if it's true, then that does not mean that you are wrong and you have to go to jail for that. So that is something that you can think about uh, as we move forward, as the colonists start questioning the, uh, the royal government in chapter five, as they start saying the things they're doing are wrong and the British government keeps trying to take away their rights. This is why 
freedom of press is also an amendment number one, is that this is something that is guaranteed to us. It is our right to question the people in charge, and the election that is currently going on is a huge part of that. Is the government allowed to shut down the press? Are they allowed to tell them they're only allowed to write certain stories, which is stuff that happens all around during the time period of our elections that always comes up and it's always a part. It's number one in the Constitution along with the freedom of assembly that we learned about in section one. So you can start seeing that connection between events and things that happen pre-American Revolution and during the American Revolution and then how those things make their way into our laws that we know today. And then as we pick up with section three, we'll get into finally, we're gonna meet George Washington for the first time, a young George Washington, and then we'll get into our first real battles of what we're gonna know as our first war that we're gonna learn about, the French and Indian War.